This presentation is a review of The Long 20th Century, Money, Power, and the Origins of Our Times by Giovanni Arrighi. This book details the history of capitalism from its early beginnings in Italy during the 14th century to the United States' capitalist hegemony in the 20th century. Arrighi examines the changing fortunes of Venetian, Genoese, Dutch, British, and finally the United States. His analysis compares four long centuries of systemic cycles of capital accumulation that led to the ascendancy of the Dutch, British, and United States superpowers. Arrighi focuses specifically on how the maturity and eventual decline of these cycles of capital accumulation in every major development of the capitalist world is heralded by a particular switch from trade in commodities to trade in money. First is the Genoese cycle from the 15th to the early 17th centuries. Second is the Dutch cycle from the late 16th century through most of the 18th. Third is the British cycle from the latter half of the 18th century through the early 20th century. And fourth is the US cycle, which began in the late 19th century and has continued into the current phase of financial expansion that Arrighi refers to as the long 20th century. Arrighi based the interpretive scheme of this book on the work of Fernand Braudel, who argued that finance capital is not a particular stage of world capitalism, let alone its latest and highest stage. Rather, it is a recurrent phenomenon which has marked the capitalist era from its early beginnings in late medieval and early modern Europe. Arrighi concludes the book by examining the hegemonic forces that have shaped and could now possibly undermine the U.S. Empire's long 20th century. Defining Capitalism Arrighi defines capitalism as something born out of and historically contingent upon an older world market economy. Arrighi asserts that capitalism grew out of the conflict between many previous war-making power struggles for territory and population control, and the many state-making trade relationships developing between different world markets. For Arrighi, this book is not meant to explain the origins of this world market economy that was already the underlying structure of material life long before capitalism arose as a world system. Instead, this book is meant to explain how capitalism rose above the structures of the pre-existing world market economy and, over time, acquired its power to reshape the markets and lives of the entire world. Arrighi views capitalism as a multi-tiered structure, a structure in which, as in all hierarchies, the upper layer could not exist without the lower stages on which they depend. In this book, Arrighi focuses specifically on the upper layer of capital accumulation in the capitalist hierarchy, and how that accumulation has unfolded in each long century that has produced a new world power that secured control over an expanding world economic space. However, Arrighi admits that this book is not meant to reconstruct capitalism's entire history as a world economic force. Instead, Arrighi has directed this book primarily on the history of the top layer of capital accumulation in the capitalist hierarchy, because as Arrighi humbly states, we cannot do everything at once. Territorialism versus Capitalism Throughout the book, Arrighi interweaves the analysis of two major forms of world power that eventually formed modern capitalism. The first is territorialism, which perceives territorial expansion as central to its expanding military and state power over land and populations, with capital as a means to expand more territorially. And second, capitalism, which considers territorial expansion primarily as a possible instrument for more capital accumulation. As Arrighi explains, in the territorialist strategy, controls over territory and population is the objective, and control over mobile capital the means of state and war making. In the capitalist strategy, the relationship is turned upside down. Control over mobile capital is the objective, and control over territory and population the means. The Origins of Capital Accumulation Arrighi details how the formation and expansion of the Dutch, British, and United States capitalist hegemons were modeled on the developing interstate system of commerce first established by Italian city-states in the 14th century. However, each of the three hegemons held a different balance of power between their capitalist and territorialist logics in the interstate system of commercial exchange. As Arrighi explains, the critical feature of this interstate system has been the constant opposition of the capitalist and territorialist logics of power and the recurrent resolution of their contradictions through the reorganization of world political economic space by the leading state of the epoch. This 14th century world interstate system of commerce and trade in the subsystem of Italian city-states pre-configured some main features of the modern capitalist world, 
For instance, the invention of high finance. The protection producing industry of war making and state making, including a self perpetuating system of commercialized violence that Arrighi calls military Keynesianism, and the extensive networks of residential diplomacy meant for managing trade related information gathering and balancing the struggle between differing territorialist and capitalist powers. This early residential diplomacy among early Italian city-states was centered mostly in Venice, Florence, Genoa, and Milan. And while all these Italian city-states played a significant role in capitalism's early emergence, as Arrighi highlights, Venice is the true prototype of the capitalist state. The residential diplomacy developed between these city-states and Italy tipped the balance of world economic power toward a more capitalist approach over a more territorialist approach. By 1420, these Italian city-states had revenues that were comparable to the dynastic feudal states of Spain and Portugal. As Arrighi highlights, these Italian city-states thereby showed that even small territories could become huge containers of power by pursuing one-sidedly the accumulation of riches rather than the acquisition of territories and subjects. The First Genoese Cycle of Capital Accumulation this early capitalist approach in Italy led to the first significant cycle of capital accumulation in the city-state of Genoa that tightened the dominance of capital over the enlarged world economy through complex systems of high finance. However, the technical virtuosity on the part of the Genoese merchant bankers was not enough to completely overthrow the medieval system of rule on a worldwide scale. One major reason, according to Arrighi, is that the Genoese merchant bankers had never been self-sufficient in organizing the protection needed by its long-distance traffics. This created high protection costs for the Genoese financiers who were always plagued with violent domestic competitive struggles and endless feuds that eventually forced them to buy outside protection from the Iberian territorialist rulers of Spain and Portugal, which significantly undermined their profiteering schemes. In other words, the very logic of profit-making restrained the self-expansion of Genoese capital and thereby threatened it with self-destruction. It wouldn't be until the rise of the Dutch republics in the late 16th century before a new kind of capitalist state, the United Provinces, would be presented with and seize the opportunity to transform the European system of rule to the requirements of the accumulation of capital on a world scale. The Dutch Hegemony and the Second Cycle of Capital Accumulation the second cycle of capital accumulation started in the late 16th century and was dominated by the United Provinces, who were a collection of Dutch republics that revolted against feudalism. As Arrighi explains, these Dutch republics became hegemonic by leading a large and powerful coalition of dynastic states toward the liquidation of the medieval system of rule. Arrighi details that this liquidation of the European feudal system by the United Provinces led to the first world interstate system established by the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. This new Westphalia interstate system of commerce established state sovereignty that rests on international law and the balance of power, a law operating between rather than above states, and a power operating between rather than above states. Arrighi argues this reorganization of worldwide political and economic space, marked by the Westphalia system's establishment, is the historical birth of the capitalist state and became dominated by a Dutch capitalist oligarchy that utilized similar high finance tactics used by the Genoese, however with some key differences. According to Arrighi, the Dutch capitalist oligarchy did more than just lead the world in capital accumulation. They also reintroduced the standardized approach to military tactics once seen in the Roman Empire. Marching, loading, and firing guns became a regular practice in the Dutch republics and was a critical innovation that neutralized the large-scale advantages of war making once dominated by Spain and Portugal. This localized militaristic approach by the Dutch created an internalization of protection costs for the Dutch capitalist oligarchy and turned protection costs into revenues. However, this Dutch way of making wars pay for themselves inspired other European states like France and England to do the same, and ironically, began undermining the hegemony of the Dutch capitalist oligarchy almost as soon as it began. British Hegemony and Free Trade Imperialism In 1652, only four years after implementing the Westphalia interstate system, the hegemony of the Dutch began to be challenged by England in the Anglo-Dutch War and then by France in the Franco-Dutch War beginning in 1672. According to Arrighi, by the 18th century the global power struggle set in motion by the Westphalia interstate system had enabled a new synthesis of the capitalist state called mercantilism dominated by France and England. 
This new mercantilist approach relied on three interrelated components, settler colonialism, capitalist slavery, and economic nationalism. The success of settler colonialism by European nations eventually set in motion the world hegemony of the British, but it also created shortages of labor power which could not be satisfied by relying exclusively, or even primarily, on the supplies engendered spontaneously from within the ranks of settler populations or extracted forcibly from indigenous populations. So the European solution to settler colonial labor shortages was to secure slave labor primarily from Africa to maintain capitalist enterprises' profitability. Settler colonialism and capitalist slavery were necessary but still insufficient conditions for the mercantilist success of England and France. The missing ingredient was an internalization of production costs by what Arrighi calls economic nationalism. Economic nationalism combines the pursuit of endless capital accumulation and interstate commerce with state and war making directed toward national economy making. Economic nationalism was able to internalize production costs by reallocating increased tax revenues derived from the benefits of world commerce, of settler colonialism, and of capitalist slavery and turn these benefits into adequate rewards for entrepreneurship and productive efforts of their metropolitan subjects. According to Origi, economic nationalism created new incentives and opportunities to establish ever new linkages between activities and thus make wars pay for themselves more and more. Britain eventually won the struggle against France for world supremacy on these fronts after the Seven Years' War between 1756 and 1763. But even though Britain had attained a competitive advantage over France, its world hegemony was not yet complete due to the systemic chaos from rebellious uprisings, especially in the colonies of the newly forming United States. According to Origi, Britain didn't become truly hegemonic until it adopted a free trade imperialism in the 1800s that expanded and superseded the Westphalia system established in 1648. Arigi explains the Westphalia system was based on the principle that there was no authority operating above the interstate system. Free trade imperialism, in contrast, established the principle that the laws operating within and between states were subject to the higher authority of a new, metaphysical entity, a world market ruled by its own laws, allegedly endowed with supernatural powers greater than anything Pope and Emperor had ever mastered a medieval system of rule. This metaphysical higher authority in Britain's free trade imperialism was the monetary value of its assets, not the autonomous power of its rulers. This ushered in an entirely new kind of world empire that, by the 19th century, enabled Britain to wield a quasi-monopolistic control over universally accepted means of payment, world money, to ensure compliance to their commands, not just within their widely scattered domains, but by the sovereigns and subjects of other political domains as well. Although the emergence of Britain's world hegemony of free trade imperialism created the basis for the third cycle of capital accumulation, it was shorter lived than both the second cycle dominated by the Dutch and the first cycle dominated by the Genoese. Nonetheless, it was able to effectively control a political economic space larger than any previous world empire had ever accomplished before. U.S. Hegemony in the Long 20th Century By the end of the 19th century, the decisive factor in the struggle for world power was the size and growth of a nation's domestic market. For instance, since the United States had embarked on such an unprecedented and ruthless domestic territorialism against North America's indigenous people, it created a wealth surplus that was able to rival Britain's and eventually take over its hegemonic control over the world interstate system. As Origi put it, the United States developed into a sort of black hole with a power of attraction for the labor, capital, and entrepreneurship of Europe with which the United Kingdom, let alone less wealthy and powerful states, had few chances of competing. This black hole of attraction developed such a deep-seated cross-fertilization of capitalist and territorialist logics of power in the U.S., especially domestically, that U.S. capitalism and territorialism were indistinguishable from one another. Arrighi makes clear, however, that the rise of U.S. hegemony in the 20th century was accompanied and enabled by the parallel rise of Germany as a formidable world power. Arrighi explains how Germany's rise was supported by its spectacular industrialization in military and industrial innovations since the 1840s. Nevertheless, this increase in military capabilities did not fundamentally change Germany's position in the world economy large in part because Germany could not compete with the wealth created by the domestic territorialism of the U.S. Arrighi argues this drove Germany toward a more obsessive militaristic approach across Europe with devastating consequences to Britain, but ultimately self-destructive consequences for itself. As he states, 
This obsession drove German rulers to try to first follow in the British and then in the U.S. path of territorial expansion. However, their attempts triggered a sudden escalation of interstate conflicts, which first undermined and then destroyed the foundations of British hegemony, but in the process inflicted even greater damage to the national wealth, power, and prestige of Germany itself. The U.S. benefited most from the outcomes of World War I and World War II, and eventually became the new world hegemonic power by the 20th century. However, just like during the rise of the Dutch and British hegemonies, the rise of the U.S. did not come without many revolutionary uprisings by various non-Western and propertyless people. Arrighi highlights that this revolutionary pushback by non-Western and propertyless people reached its apogee with the Russian Revolution of 1917 that fought back against free trade imperialism. Alongside this anti-imperialist pushback, the global political economic space after World War I became dominated by two opposite and antagonistic factions. A conservative faction dominated by Britain and France oriented towards the preservation of free trade imperialism, and a reactionary faction led by Nazi Germany that was, as Arrighi put it, upstarts in the struggle for world power who had neither a respectable colonial empire nor the right connections in the networks of world commerce and finance. However, after World War II, the damage to the conservative faction and the reactionary faction led to the rise of the Soviet Union as a world power. The development of the Soviet Union pitted the USSR and the USA against each other in a bitter worldwide struggle famously known as the Cold War. Nonetheless, according to Arrighi, this dichotomous concentration of power that defined the Cold War period set the stage for the remaking of the interstate system to accommodate the anti-imperial demands of non-Western peoples and of the propertyless masses. Arrighi explains that, like the Napoleonic Wars 150 years earlier, the Second World War acted as a powerful transmission belt for social revolution which, during and after the war, spread to the entire non-Western world in the form of national liberation movements. In the aftermath of World War II, a period of what Arrighi calls decolonization occurred, in which all people who constituted themselves as a national community in the interstate system of commerce were granted the right to self-determination by the development of the United Nations. Under the leadership of U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt, the development of the United Nations was the first attempt by world powers to create a world government meant to supersede all forms of state authority by political means. Roosevelt called his idealistic vision of a one world government controlled by the UN, One Worldism. One Worldism paralleled the idealism behind the U.S.'s New Deal after the Great Depression and included the USSR among the poor nations of the world to be incorporated into the evolving Pax Americana for the benefit and security of all. However, upon Roosevelt's death, his predecessor Harry Truman changed this idealistic one-worldism vision into a Cold War-inspired free-worldism, exemplified by the Truman Doctrine, that, as Arrighi states, institutionalized U.S. control over world money and over global military power as the primary instruments of U.S. hegemony. The U.S. hegemony, based on a worldwide monetary and military control, had fundamental differences from the hegemony of Britain's free trade imperialism. For one thing, world money came to be regulated by the U.S. Federal Reserve, acting in concert with select central banks of other states, which gave the U.S. much greater economic flexibility than the British government ever experienced under a privately regulated gold standard currency. But, according to Arrighi, the most critical departure from British free trade imperialism, and what truly defines the long 20th century, is the development of U.S. transnational corporations. This corporate feature of U.S. hegemony is contended by Arrighi to be partially a regression back toward the technical virtuosity of high finance employed by the previously discussed class of Genoese merchant bankers. However, with some unique differences. By 1971, after the disintegration of the Bretton Woods system when Richard Nixon detached the dollar from the gold standard, U.S. corporations developed into transnational entities free from any state authority and had the power to subject it to business rules and regulations on every member of the global interstate system. This power, combined with the size, insularity, and natural wealth of the United States, enabled its capitalist class to internalize not just protection costs and production costs, as the British capitalist class had already done, but transaction costs as well. That is to say, the markets on which the self-expansion of its capital depended. This new transnational corporate hegemony, supported and protected by the military-industrial complex of the U.S., is what Arrighi defines as the free enterprise system. As Arrighi explains, the emergence of this free enterprise system, free that is, from the constraints imposed on world-scale processes of capital accumulation by the territorial exclusiveness of states, has been the most distinctive outcome of U.S. hegemony. 
and is the face of the long 20th century we find ourselves in today. You get up on your little 21-inch screen and howl about America and democracy. There is no America. There is no democracy. There is only IBM and ITT and AT&T and DuPont, Dow, Union Carbide and Exxon. Those are the nations of the world today. What do you think the Russians talk about in their councils of state? Karl Marx? They get out their linear programming charts, statistical decision theories, minimax solutions, and compute the price cost probabilities of their transactions and investments, just like we do. We no longer live in a world of nations and ideologies, Mr. Beale. The world is a college of corporations, inexorably determined by the immutable bylaws of business. The world is a business, Mr. Beale. 